And with no breakthrough on bringing fuel prices under GST, I'm joined by one of the country's most erudite finance ministers, the finance minister of Tamil Nadu, Dr. Panali Ben uh, Thyagarajan joins me. Appreciate your joining us, Dr. Thyagarajan. The big question that's being asked is today at the GST council meeting, it seems all states unanimously opposed even initiating talks on in bringing in uh, petrol and diesel under the GST ambit. Why? Why this resistance? Is the resistance primarily from states who are worried that you will lose a primary source of revenue? Uh, Rajdeep, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Thanks for the kind introduction. Let me just say that uh, all of these uh, states' positions should be seen in context, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let us start from the fact that uh, India is about the only country where 100% of direct taxation lies only with the union. Mm -hmm. In the constitution, a substantial portion of indirect taxation, sales tax, VAT, etc., was with the states. Mm -hmm. After the onset of GST, we have also lost a large part of that variability, that flexibility, that authority. The two real main authorities left in the hands of the states now are the taxation of alcohol and related products mm -hmm. and petrol, diesel and related products. So, inherently, states are reluctant to give up one of the last levers left in the entire gamut of taxation, with the bulk of it residing in Delhi. Now, some could argue that the GST Council is actually the voice of everybody, but as we have seen in the last five years, effectively what the union wants, the union gets. Now, there's, a, there's yet one other issue. In my note to the council, which I've sent you a copy, please go look at our response to that point. We have pointed out that in the last seven years, the union's taxation of petrol and diesel has risen by between five and ten times, depending on the product, you know, less for petrol and more for diesel. And not just that, that the ratio of excise duty, which is shareable to states, versus cess and surcharge, which is only retained by the union, has swung from 90% or so excise to 4% excise. 96% of the union's taxation is in cess and surcharge. Under these circumstances, were we to give up the state taxation and put it into GST, it is completely a huge revenue loss for us. No, so in my note, all I've said is, once the, once the union agrees to remove cess and surcharge, we will reconsider our position. No, so therefore, that's precisely it. Why not at least have a discussion on it? It seems the center claims all we want is why don't the states come up with a timeline? Let's discuss this, is what is being suggested uh, yeah, by I, the center. I think... I think I think that's a bit disingenuous. If you get somebody to send you the actual agenda, this was a matter that was taken to the High Court of Kerala and the, and the High Court ruled that the union and the GST council should consider and come back with this considered view. The considered view of the council is that it's not an appropriate fit. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all it was. It, has no, it wasn't as if it was imperative that a timeline had to be announced. The court require, required, the judgment required that it be considered. It was considered and a response was given. But do you agree fundamentally that as a result of this, centre and states are free to raise uh, excise duties on fuel prices and as a result of this cascading effect of taxation, the consumer is suffering? There is one study which suggests that if, G if fuel prices come under GST, the cost could come down by as much as 50%. Do you broadly agree that bringing fuel prices under GST would ensure a greater rationality in fuel prices, yes or no? Uh, I think you have the wrong end of the stick, right? Right now, there's nothing to prevent uh, states or the union from lowering or raising taxes. There's, there's no That's requirement right. that it should be only one direction. For example, after we came to power less than four months ago, we have lowered the, the uh, state tax on petrol because we wanted to see the multiplier effect and because we committed to do, doing so. Our predecessors, the ADMK regime, had never lowered it. They would only ever raised it. Mm -hmm. And the union has mostly raised it, as I said, between five and ten times. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking to move it to GST as a way of putting a lock on the individual decision-making abilities of the states and the union, that is a different perspective. If you say, right now it only goes up, it doesn't go down, that's based on individual choices. Right now there's flexibility to do almost anything you want. Why would anybody willingly give up that flexibility? I, you know, look at it. You know, I often say this, where you stand depends on where you sit. M.K. Stalin, chief minister and your leader, in on January 25th, 20, 2018 says, only if the fuel prices are brought within the purview of the GST or the excise duties brought down by the center, petrol and diesel could be supplied to the general public at a reasonable price. 
Now, this is what is said when you are in the opposition. Now, when you are in government, you are virtually suggesting, look, we cannot, we cannot do this because we are losing our right no, or no, our power please, over collecting yeah, please, revenue please. through uh, diesel and petrol. Yeah, please read my submission. I say that under the history of the last seven years and the rates as they are now, yes, we are not willing to consider it. I have clearly stated, let me read the actual words of my submission. No, yes, I, just give me a second. I have this your... cannot be examined in isolation without examining the overall resource distribution. Yes. Therefore, if and when the union were to drop the levy of all cess and surcharge on such products, we would be happy to reconsider our position at such a time. Mm -hmm. Now, let's not forget that between 18 and 21, the union has shifted a whole bunch of excise away, once in 20 and once in 21. Mm -hmm. The ratio of excise to cess and surcharge was only about uh, 65 35 in, uh, 19, in 2018. Yes. It is now 4%. Uh, excise and 96 percent cess and surcharge. Our, our, we have been squeezed. We used to get about 20 25 paisa a liter, now we get about two, right? So, we also have to find some way to make revenue. No, no, so it, it's all boiling down to equitable allocation of revenues and resources collected through various forms of taxation. We thought, and that was the presumption when the GST came in, that we would have a regime which would ensure that, which would ensure an equitable distribution and would thereby give states also far more revenues than they were earlier collecting. That was the, that was the basis for a GST, a, a, un, a, a taxation system that was simpler, rational, and ensuring an equitable allocation of resources. Are you saying the system itself has failed? And to that extent, petrol and diesel are a prime example of what you've not been able to achieve through it. Yeah, I, I'd go one step more than that. I think that the ambitions around GST were uh, uh, manifold and different for different people. So earlier in my note, I point out that the whole notion of the benefits of GST have failed to be realized. It was never about uh, kind of uh, a guarantee of raising incomes. It was supposed to be a ease of doing business, yes. a standardization of interstate commerce, and therefore a shift which we all understood of taxation away from production towards consumption, which would help the poorer states where they consume more than, than they produce. Yes. It was actually going to be not that different for a state like Tamil Nadu because our Gini coefficient, our inequality is low and therefore our per capita consumption is high. We are both a high producer and a high consumer. So we did not expect that it would have that much impact on us. But let's say if you take a Maharashtra, definitely they were going to lose revenue because they're much higher producer than consumer. And if you take a you, uh, Uttar Pradesh, they are definitely much higher consumer than producer. So they were going to get the benefit. In fact, when you look at the data, and I'm saying COVID, of course, messed up everything. But let's leave COVID out. Mm -hmm. Pre-COVID from 2017 to 2020, the benefits of the system or the expected benefits have not been realized. Whereas the unexpected complexities have been very, very high. And I've stated this again in my document. Yes. So I would go back and say that not only were we uh, kind of over-optimistic on GST. There is a more fundamental problem here. As you know, there are two types of taxation. One is direct and one is indirect. Everything we talk about, GST, sales tax, petrol, diesel, alcohol, all of these are indirect taxation. Indirect taxation is inherently regressive because it is a point of sale taxation yes. that we don't know who we levy it on and we know for sure that the poor, the middle class spend a greater proportion of their income or wealth on taxable goods and services, which people don't consume 100 times more than poor people, but they make 100 times the money sometimes. So it is really direct taxation that ought to be the basis of all discussions of fairness, whether it is center to state or whether it's rich to poor. Mm -hmm. That power is 100% with the union. You know, it is, there's no, if you go to America, for example, or China, the direct taxation powers devolve all the way down to the cities. The cities, the states, the union, or the federal government. We don't have that. So that's where the real problem lies because we would like to do direct taxation, which is much more progressive and fair. You know, so therefore what I'm sensing is that uh, what you're suggesting is actually GST has weakened federalism. We thought that it would strengthen perhaps some of the federal uh, uh, impulses within our system, that states would feel uh, uh, that they were getting their due. That's not happened is what you're suggesting. Therefore, give me an yeah. alternative because the fact is people are being burdened. Oil prices are, even when global oil prices are low, the burden is being passed on to the consumer. Therefore, people are saying, look, 
if you want a fair system which was we were told it would be fair transparent based on market price is not happened now yeah I, do you I have a you, you have limit, a solution I, I, well, yeah, I don't think you should limit GST to a discussion only of petrol and diesel, right? Sure. Petrol and diesel was never in GST before and it's not now. So if you're going to look at petrol and diesel, you should look at what has been the behavior of state governments over the last, let's say, seven, eight, nine years. What has been the behavior of the union government in terms of taxes? Of course, oil prices have dropped from uh, above 100 to, mm -hmm. you know, first down as low as 30 and now 50, 60, 70. What has been the taxation model of the union government? What has been the taxation model of the state government? For example... The Honorable Union Finance Minister made a statement a few weeks ago when we cut the petrol tax by 3 rupees. She said Tamil Nadu is playing trickery. They raised the rates by 7 rupees in two tranches and now they've cut it by 3. They're just playing games. And I made the point, no, no, it's not. It's the exact opposite of what you said. It's not where I stand depends on where I sit. When we were in opposition, we opposed the ADMK raising the taxes twice. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have come to power. And because of change of regime, we have cut the price, the taxes, just as we said that we, you should not raise. So, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of issues in petrol tax. Now, go back to GST for a second. Mm -hmm. GST, in my opinion, was not particularly well thought out or implemented. I'll just give you one example. This is the full agenda book for this meeting. It's 500 and something pages. The crucial part of this in terms of rate setting is item number, uh, fitment committee, item number 14. It is 120 pages worth of decisions around rates for products going from coconut oil to uh, uh, lubricants to uh, tools to any number of things. What is this fitment committee? It is not a, a committee of elected officials who are sitting and doing this work. Now you have a meeting that goes for six hours or eight hours of which there are 18 agenda items. One of those agenda items is this fitment committee it's a recommendation that has literally hundreds or tens of items. Right. Right. How is this a democratic process where it's a federal process where we're picking up anything? Is it realistic that you can have this discussion in the time that we had to meet? Right. I, so I think the system itself is fundamentally flawed in its design. So in conclusion, you're calling for a complete revamp, relook at the way the GST council system works. Am I correct? Very quickly. Yeah, I, I've been consistent from uh, 2017. Before the implementation of GST, uh, a friend of mine and I wrote an article in the Mint newspaper. And we said, there is a downside of one nation, one tax. You will lose rights to the states. It will be a federalism kind of black hole if things don't go exactly as envisioned or ideally in mm -hmm. the council and in other mechanisms. And the fears that we had have come true, have come true in spades. So I think the fundamental point, first meeting I attended as a member, the 43rd meeting, I gave a comprehensive document stating what were all the issues that were wrong mm -hmm. and what all I thought could be fixed or made better. And I said, this is a once in a lifetime chance for us to set this right. Because most of the members here, unlike me, have right. been around since the start of it. Anyway, we have a natural breaking point coming at the end of the compensation period of five years. We also have a disaster like COVID, a once in a generation or once in right. a century disaster that sharpens the mind because it tells us what the real problems are. You know what Buffett said, when right. the water goes out, you realize who's swimming with our trunks. So we have discovered what the real extent of problems are. Let's use it to do fundamental overhaul. Is the problem though, in conclusion, a trust deficit with uh, between opposition rule states and the center or is it a fundamental problem of just the way it's structured between states and the center? I think it is a, a problem of immense complexity that was rushed to implementation without adequate thought, adequate testing, adequate kind of iterative uh, consultation, design, revamp, etc. Okay. That is the fundamental problem. All this about politics and all secondary, tertiary. Yes, there are going to be differences of opinion, not just about opposition versus not opposition, about net donor states versus net recipient states. There are all kinds of differences of opinion. But if the system itself is profoundly flawed in its design and mm -hmm. its implementation, then okay. that's the source of all problems. Everything else is secondary to that. It just exacerbates the problem. Let's leave it there. I think you've given us a sense of just why we are still struggling to get fuel, petrol and diesel within the GST ambit. It's a far more complex issue that will require much discussion. But for now, Dr. Panadi Bail Thyagarajan, as always, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for joining me here on the news today. Thanks. Thanks for having me.